there I was, crouching over a glorified conveyor belt on top of a tent or a 30-foot derrick in the sky, clutching a bronze sieve in my hands, wondering how the hell I got there. How I found myself in the wilderness regions where the Rowans meet the Book Cliffs on the Colorado-Utah border had to do with a series of drilling permits that were about to expire. Essentially, the way mineral leasing works is if you don't start the drill within five years, you lose the permit and have to reapply. These new rigs popping up along this vital runoff and migration corridor are what they call exploratory, drawing out a bunch of geologists and private contractors from Texas, Wyoming, and Colorado with investors looking to make a buck now that the reserves have dried up in the Permian and Williston basins, all out there in search of black gold. Why was I up there though? A lowly welder and politically exhausted river guide like myself? Good question. Similar to river guiding, working in welding and manufacturing means going wherever the work is to a certain degree. At that point in the crude bonanza, spring of 2023, I felt I could justify recording rocks and conducting maintenance for gas monitors as I was working on setting up my own machine shop anyways. Now, I'm no geologist, but my work history and ability to make spreadsheets apparently made me generally qualified for this kind of work. Um, and I don't know about you, but anyone, well, for me, after years of carpentry, river guiding, mech and welding work as a woman, my imposter syndrome is desensitized and has been gaslit as fuck. And uh, <laughs> building a shop takes money. So I'm like, great, let's do this. And uh, I end up mob logging on an exploratory well that I discover will be growing up to 30 plus rig sites in one of the most vital unprotected ecosystems left in the upper waters of the Colorado River Basin. So the way it works is you have two stainless steel pipes, one with a larger diameter, and this interspatial volume between them is how the mud to collect the samples from are sent up through a process of pumping billions of gallons, gallons of groundwater, water diverted from nearby canals and runoff streams, water um, plus a bunch of chemicals that don't show up on your typical Google search, Sometimes diesel gasoline is added in addition to the water through the water tables into the depths of upwards of 10,000 feet below the surface. The bit will then continue laterally for another six or so thousand feet until it hits the target depth, AKA oil. The ground up rock is then shaken along the belt and the mud logger, that would be me, scoops up enough of these rocks to gather a mud sample. That sample is cleaned, placed under a microscope, and tested with various methods to find out if the sands hold oil. There are specific characteristics they look for to classify an oil reserve as high waxy crude, commonly called black gold. And as it turns out, the Green River Formation's fossils are just that type of oil sands. Who I was shacked up with for what was to be the next 16 days was someone who's called a mud engineer. Now, you know, they really do just throw that term around nowadays, engineer, like, you know, yeah. And uh, anyways, it's basically a Charlie Day of the Mailroom type of character, um, works 24 hour shifts, concocts the chemical potion that will be used to lubricate the drill bit and the rock as it's bored through. And they are always the same. I hate to admit it, and I usually don't like to generalize, but if it quacks like a duck, you get the idea. That guy, that was who I was living with in a single bathroom trailer because I guess they'd forgotten there was going to be a woman on site or at least that's what they told me. And after driving three and a half hours to this well site, I find out uh, Charlie from Trinidad, Colorado, who believes vaccines cause autism, was my new bunk buddy. The guy who confidently states to me and a group of workers that quote, the natives y'all got out here in Utah are rough looking. Legal in any other workplace, probably not. But what had I expected from an industry that has what's called cleanup crews, which are crews on call specifically to handle workplace, workplace deaths and accidents. You see, the cleaners handle the incident site 
and a lawyer and an accountant handle the payoff and the NDA to witnesses and victims of the families. Welcome to oil country. As my father asked once in response to the welding work I was doing for a nat gas, sometimes and accurately called methane gas operation back in the day, have you heard of a canary in a coal mine? The point he was making was not lost upon me. Yeah. So anyways, my new bunk bait, bunkmate was now holding a visibly strong distaste of me after I told him what he said is racist, while inside I worried about what he meant exactly, knowing exactly what man camps bring to rural areas and reservations. Because you see, another common thing I hear from the contractors and workers coming in from Texas, Wyoming, and Colorado that run 24-7, rotating through for 12 hour shifts, split between day and night, lasting for two to three weeks, give or take, before flying back home for their six or so days off, are misplaced complaints stating that the tribal permits here take too long. Subsequently, I am always brushed off when I explain it's because Ute Nation actually has some semblance of an EIS and an environmental review process left conversely to the rest of the counties. Now, there's not enough time here to get into the complexities of how mineral leasing and eminent domain works on tribal, state, federal, and private lands, but you get the idea. Now, during these types of conversations, I am reminded of the privilege my skin affords in these spaces. To put these numbers in perspective, not once have there been crews with locals from the basin where I live, let alone another woman. <clears throat> now, any of you out there that have been the first to look different in your workforce or career of choice, you know as well as I do that there are insurmountable pressures with being the first. In my case, hopefully not the last woman hired to these types of jobs, having been the first or only woman in nearly every single shop along the way, which is many, like many. And hopping back and forth between the work trailer and Derek, as samples are collected by increments of anywhere from 10 to 100 feet, I was again reminded of this at one point when I was sampling in a trailer packed with eight men, seven of whom were the investors and landowners that had flown in on a private jet for an update on the progress and projections from the geosteering data. Then there's me in oil-stained FR gear, just listening to their conversations as I bounce in and out, sensing tensions and pressure on my boss from the men that were banking on striking oil. It was sort of like watching nature's stock market of gases, oil sands, minerals, and materials. Um, and eventually, I was able to spot the guys that clearly had more on the line than others, the newbies to this game of gambling on oil in this terrain. Um, and the men and the promise of the new technologies being able to deliver. So no, why not throw their extra trust fund cash in? It's black gold in 2024 in Utah, baby. And it's not like they have to breathe or drink the consequences from the ozone emissions or crystalline silica dust. Or listening to one of the tycoon veterans with stories from the last oil boom of the 80s naming these newly discovered layers miles below the Earth's surface, things like Bonanza Top and Bottom, as we drilled through them, analyzing the rocks to determine the approximate formation and geologic period, reassuring his investment along the way. His heavy hand pounding down on my shoulder as he was leaving in what seemed intended as a warm gesture, and a guy who never really spoke directly to me, stating to my boss to, quote, keep this one around, nodding in my direction, and me thinking, you sure? While smiling politely. Uh, and their notable anxiety as they talked of the dollars going into this investment, what the cost was per day for some of these sites, wanting samples to place in their offices, expressing how they love the smell of oil, the same stench I can't get out of my work clothes for the life of me and gives me skin rashes and headaches. A professor of geoscience is calling for updates because these, quote, remote drill sites along the state border are all the buzz over here at the university, i.e. the Colorado University of Mining, mentioning that the seismic data processing for the Duchesne 
and basin boundary faults were called off because it was going to be too expensive. Something about the difficulty of coordinating the topography and the helicopter, or with the helicopters and the imaging technology. Now, after the Trump era environmental and mineral leasing rollbacks that were supported by Utah's legislature and current governor, despite local protests and a lot of outreach, a floodgate was opened for these companies and investors. Privately owned entities that have been eyeing what's called the Tar Sands Triangle, the Uinta Basin, and Utah's land grab battle since the early 2010s flocked to the region throwing excess cash at efforts to overturn designations like Bears Ears and Grand Staircase, fighting to dismantle any industry regulation under the sun in the process, filling the pockets of Utah's state representatives and commissioners who would push for crude and liquefied nat gas specific rail lines and road easements throughout regions like Nine Mile Canyon and the Duchesne, Strawberry, Green, Upper Yampa, Big Trujillo, and White Rivers. A month after that drill ended, I turned in a notice of resignation, spending about five months working for that geologging company. I learned that without the geosciences, there would not be wells on this scale throughout the remnants of what is ancient Lake Uinta, as the investments would be too risky, allowing or assuming that they would have been allowed a permit in the first place following a proper environmental review. And I realized I shouldn't be profiting off of it all, even if I could do it. It felt different than previous reclamation and subcontracted welding work I had done regionally because I was being an active participant in this energy boom and all the emissions, environmental destruction and water use that go into crude and nat gas operations all of which are being hidden from the public eye. Now, separating aspiration from a fight or flight response has always been a little tricky for me. And this is obvious if you look at my work history. <clears throat> and being a woman in STEM, and I know pretty much all of you out there that are in manufacturing, trades, the outdoor industry, really any industry for that matter can relate to this sentiment. It all comes with an inherent demand for fight, fighting for opportunities, fighting to gain the knowledge, fighting for workplace safety protocols, fighting for a fair wage, fighting against sexual harassment, workplace violence, and other acts that are too often ignored across the board. And these gender roles and expectations present a new layer of nuance and complications as fight is a relative term. We're supposed to fight a certain way as women docile yet firm, twice as smart but not too smart, three times as patient, you know the drill. But fighting these tropes that are more apparent than ever can get exhausting. And after stepping away from river guiding during the pandemic, I came to see the guiding industry as sort of like running chemotherapy on dying landscapes and struggling rural economies. But it has been a way for me to experience these wilderness areas as they exist before they are gone to learn as much about each and every piece of the canyons and the waterways that carve these arteries in order to share this information. And I guess in a backwards way, I have applied that mentality to working through the crude fracking bonanza and in all these fab shops along the way and my inability to quiet the nagging voice of reason on my shoulder. The one that's good at pattern recognition and never shuts up. The one shouting about how the irony of the hasty destruction of the planet and each other is that our survival as a species depends on this planet that we continue to manage in unsustainable ways under the guise of economic survival and energy independence. The work I've done being a constant reminder of an unironic diaspora. I've survived flash floods, encountered wolves, been stalked by cougars, and seen their countabout kills. You can spot them in the way the deceased animal carcass is draped and torn from a specific angle, often with a neck puncture wound and then a ravaged stomach intestinal area. Nothing is ever left but hair, bones, and hooves usually. It looks different than the kill from a poacher or a hauler or an inexperienced rancher. And after facing unmapped rapids on wild rivers, hypothermia, moose, bears in Alaska even, 
Nothing has tested my will, spirit, and survival as much as navigating the culture of toxic patriarchy and all the toxic men I would encounter along the way. Or the feeling of despair that would wash over me watching these glimpses of nature that took anywhere from 20 to billions of years to form, vanishing in under 60 seconds and the several tons of TNT that is used to blow out these thousands upon thousands of new drill sites, laced with spider webs of new roads and pipelines in a sea of power lines on stolen land. I'm still swimming down the river as far as launching my own renewable fab shop. And I stick with it because this urge to create safe and reliable job and education opportunities, helping people find their autonomy in reclamation and the outdoors, making renewable materials, energy and manufacturing accessible, it keeps me fighting. You wanna learn how to fix shit, build for a sustainable future and burn some metal while at it? I can help with that. <laughs> I've survived the rapids of misogyny and societal pressure so far <laughs> uh, and uh, managed to maintain my sanity, I think. <laughs> Tool by tool, job by job, I am piecing together this puzzle of a dream into my own image with hope and optimism for a tomorrow. For those of you that may feel mutually traumatized or disheartened, this is hopefully not a horror story about survival, but a hopeful one and a reminder to keep speaking out against bigotry, misinformation, environmental devastation, and above all, to trust yourself. A reminder that it's okay to walk away get that proof, and say fuck the NDA. <laughs> to anyone who can relate, in this chaotic word of, world of politics and land grabs, policing of bodies, uh, massive wage gaps, and gutting of DEI programs in states like Utah, and to all the kindred, theys, thems, and every member of the LGBTQIA plus two-spirit community, and ladies, you are not alone, and heed this call. Stick with it, no matter what your aspirations may be. The flat water is just after the next round of rapids, and you've survived it all this far. Please, just keep fighting for this planet one more day, go easy on yourself, and live your best life one day at a time.